<coughs> the Obama administration continually censors language on Islam. Using American taxpayer dollars, my money, <laughs> all federal agencies, including the FBI, the CIA, the National Counterterrorism Center, the Department of Homeland Security, and the State Department have totally rewritten their national security and counterterrorism training programs, purging them from all mention of Islamic terrorism and Islamist ideology. National security professionals are no longer learning about the goals, motivations, or strategies of Islamic terrorists and instead are taught merely to focus on terrorist behavior and, quote, de-link it from the underlying ideology that motivates it. President Obama repeatedly insists that the Islamic State is neither Islamic nor a state. And Chief Iman Kerry claims that, quote, no religion condones the killing of innocents, unquote. And in an utter refusal to acknowledge the existence of Islamic terrorism, after a wave of terrorist attacks in the West, Obama held a summit called Countering Violent Extremism, a euphemism to address the problem of Islamic terrorism, which he claims doesn't exist. All of the above examples demonstrate laws, policies, or societal pressure to censor criticism of Islam. But terrorism, or its threat, can also function as a form of censorship. In 2005, the Danish newspaper, Jelans Posten, asked several cartoonists to draw Muhammad as they saw him. They did, and their lives changed forever. Kurt Vestergaard drew a cartoon depicting a bomb in Muhammad's turban, a visual deemed blasphemous in Islam. Afterwards, Vestergaard started receiving death threats on a regular basis for a cartoon. He and his wife spent months on the run and eventually turned their bathroom into a panic room. Vestergaard also took heightened precautions, regularly changing his schedule during which time he would come and leave the house. He always had a bodyguard. He placed his house under surveillance and he carried his own personal tracking device everywhere he went but it wasn't enough. One day he was home watching his five-year-old granddaughter and there was no bodyguard attending. A Muslim assassin broke into the house wielding an ax and a knife. Vestergaard ran into the bathroom, locked himself in, and pushed the panic button, alerting the police. The terrorist was screaming, we'll get our revenge, we'll get our revenge. Eventually, the police came and arrested the assailant, who turned out to be a legal resident of Denmark who hailed from Somalia and had ties to al-Shabaab. In 2007, Vestergaard and his wife were planning to go on a trip to Paris, but somehow they never made it. The Danish intelligence swept them away in an emergency evacuation after receiving credible information that three men were targeting Vestergaard for a murder at his home. Since then, Vestergaard and his wife have moved and changed cars multiple times and never spent more than a month in one place. Vestergaard can't even go into his office and instead works from whatever shelter he's in. Muslims who threaten his life loom large, yet it is he who is the prisoner, not the would-be terrorist. And as you know, there were subsequent riots after those Danish cartoons all across Denmark and the Middle East, trashing embassies and killing numerous people over a cartoon. <clears throat> Theo van Gogh was a Dutch filmmaker and director and the great-grandnephew of the artist Vincent van Gogh. In 2004, he worked with Ian Hersey Ali to produce a short film titled Submission which demonstrated the mistreatment of women under Islam. Later that year, Van Gogh was murdered in cold blood, out in broad daylight, right in the middle of the streets of Amsterdam. After being shot several times, he fell to the ground where his attacker slit his throat in an attempt to decapitate him and then plunged the knife into his chest all the way through to his spine. The terrorist then took another knife, attached a note, and stuck it into Van Gogh's chest. 
The note threatened that Ian Hersi Ali would be next. Subsequently, Hersi Ali went into hiding. Despite the fact that she was a member of the Dutch parliament at the time, she wound up needing 24-hour protection. The terrorist turned out to be a Moroccan Dutch citizen with terror ties. Most of you probably know about the murderous attacks committed at the French satirical magazine, Charlie Hebdo, in response to the cover with the prophet Muhammad. <clears throat> On January 7th, in defense of their beloved prophet, two terrorists gunned down 12 people at Hebdo headquarters, planned and financed by Al-Qaeda of the Arabian Peninsula. Subsequently, France held a unity march, purportedly to support freedom of speech. How ironic it is then that much of the mainstream media and even the leaders of the heretofore free world refused to acknowledge that any version of Islam was responsible for those murderous attacks. Islam is a religion of peace, we were told. What we witnessed was mere violent extremism, akin to thugs down the block, I guess. Exactly one week later, Hebdo published a second Muhammad cover depicting the prophet with a tear rolling down his cheek, holding a sign that said, Je suis Charlie, and the caption that stated, Tout est pardon, all is forgiven. But even positive depictions of Muhammad are viewed as blasphemous by the Muslim world, and the cover sparked a wave of violence and protests all around the globe, which went largely unreported in America. Of course, the demonstrators denounced the cartoons of Muhammad rather than the murders of the cartoonists. In Pakistan, 30,000 people descended on Karachi, screaming, death to France, death to the blasphemers. In Niger, 45 churches were burned, homes were destroyed, and even a Christian orphanage was set ablaze. In Gaza, 200 Palestinians marched onto the French consulate, yelling, leave you French or we'll slaughter you by cutting your throats. Additional protests took place in Jordan, Senegal, Somalia, Lebanon, and elsewhere. Even the US had a protest, an event held in Texas called Stand with the Prophet in honor and respect where the speakers blamed Islamophobia for Islam's negative image. Either buying into the false narrative that so-called hate speech causes terrorism, or perhaps out of mere desperation, France, within a few short weeks, arrested 69 people, not for terrorism, but for offensive speech. The targeted offenses were speech that were anti-Semitic or that quote unquote glorified terrorism including simple Facebook posts. Indeed, the infamous comedian, Diodane, posted a Facebook comment stating, Je suis Charlie Koulibaly, emerging of the names Charlie Hebdo magazine and the terrorist of the Kosher Cafe incident. He was promptly hurled off to jail. Since then, France has unofficially declared war on quote, radical Islam, and this is before the terrorist attacks of last week, and, ha and uh, President Holland had proposed legislation to hold social media partially responsible for a hate speech posted on their sites. So you can see how well that's working. Mm -hmm. Failing to see that blasphemy laws create an environment that breeds hatred and not quells it, countries in Europe have doubled down on free speech, clearly demonstrating that France's free speech march was nothing more than a farce. And while people in America are still free to voice their opinions, to have debates or draw cartoons without fear of legal reprisal, the events that transpired in Garland, Texas of May of this, in May of this year inform us that even America is not immune to the violent consequences of defaming Islam or its prophet. In response to an event that defended the prophet, instead of condemning the Hebdo murders, Pamela Geller and her cohort, Robert Spencer, held a Draw Muhammad cartoon contest to support freedom of speech. Merely holding this event was no doubt offensive to many Muslims and non-Muslims alike, 
who viewed it as gratuitous offense. But whether you supported the contest or denounced it, one has to wonder, why is it only offense to Islam that evokes such a violent reaction? As I speak, tickets are being sold in New York to a Broadway musical titled The Book of Mormon, the profanity of which is ultimate from a Mormon point of view. Yet, the writers of that play are in no fear of violent extremist Mormons. The artists of the Piss Christ and of the painting of the Virgin Mary with cow dung on it, held at the Brooklyn Museum, have not had to hire 24-hour security. Nor have churches and Ivy League schools started seminars to indoctrinate youth on the evils of Christophobia. The difference is that those who espouse Sharia law in its full-blown expression, and I'm not saying all Muslims, but those who have supremacist aspirations, adhere to an ideology that is not just spiritual in nature, it is not just religious in nature, but it's political as well, and we should label it as such. <coughs> Finally, I feel compelled to talk for a moment about the definition of terrorism. The proper definition of terrorism is the deliberate and systematic murder, maiming, and menacing of innocent people for political ends. Innocent the way we define it in the West, not the way it's defined by Islamists. But in addition to the fact that some Islamists do not consider Islamic terrorism to be terrorism because it furthers the cause of their faith, many, like Turkey's President Erdogan, insist that terrorism doesn't require violence at all and that Islamic blasphemy constitutes, quote, the worst form of terrorism, unquote. And so asserting, he shifts the blame from the real terrorists who commit blatant murder to those who merely express an opinion, draw a cartoon, or utter an offensive truth about Islamic terrorism. Think about it. Pakistan is the main promoter of the whole Islamophobia concept. Yet, look at the Pakistani penal code. It punishes uh, blasphemy with fines, anywhere from fines to execution. And it's even blasphemy to use a phrase from the Quran if you're an Ahmadi Muslim, because the, Pakistan, the uh, Pakistani government considers Ahmadis to be heretics. So it's illegal for them to claim that they're Muslim. Former Secretary General of the OIC, General Asanoglu, asserted that the OIC's goal was to eliminate all manifestations of Islamophobia, which he defined as, quote, any anti-Islam or anti-Muslim attitude or activity, unquote. <clears throat> so notice, he's not just talking about violence or discrimination, and he isn't even just talking about speech but any thought or attitude as well. The solution for Muslims to end so-called Islamophobia is not to keep crying, poor me, poor me, we're the victims, but to stop the Islamic terrorism, to stop preaching hatred in their mosques, to join Jews and Christians in condemning Hamas and Hezbollah, and to reflect on the human rights abuses committed in the OIC countries. It is outrageous that in the West, and in America in particular, but here also, that we are taking our direction from the likes of the OIC and CARE. Here, where people are free to practice their faith, to change their faith, to have no faith, free to raise a family, to work, and pursue happiness. The idea of multiculturalism is a failure. In my view, all ideas are not equal, all religions are not equal, and all cultures are not equal. We should not be afraid to assert that the Judeo-Christian values of freedom, human rights, and equality are superior to the Islamist values of tyranny, misogyny, and religious apartheid, and gender apartheid. We shouldn't be afraid to assert that we refuse to put up with Islamic terrorism, Islamist lawfare, all this frivolous lawsuits, or intimidation. We should stop conceding bigotry to those who advocate for a two-tiered system of justice. I don't know how much you know about it, but that's what it is over there. There's one system for the Muslims and one for everybody else. Sometimes it's even three-tiered. 
We should not be engaging with the likes of the OIC. Our State Department shouldn't be working with them to implement these UN resolutions until they look at their own countries and stop discrimination against Christians, Jews, Baha'is, and Ahmadis. Until they stop the abuse of women and children, until they stop the suppression of religious freedom and freedom of speech, we should stop pretending that we're the bad guys in the name of political correctness. Those who are jailed, flogged, and otherwise oppressed, including Muslims who are oppressed in the OIC countries, look to the U.S. as their last best hope to set an example, to stand on principle, and to spread the light of freedom throughout the world. We should be signaling to those who are suffering that there is a place that stands for freedom, and that place is America, and it really should be Canada and the whole entire West. Orwell said, that the further a society drifts from the truth, the more it will hate those that speak it. Every single one of you needs to become a truth teller and hold your elected officials, school boards, and church leaders accountable. Speaking the truth about Islamic terrorism, Islamic persecution of religious minorities, or human rights violations committed in the name of Islam might not be easy. It might not be pleasant, and it's obviously not politically correct. But only the truth will keep America and the rest of the West the, free, the freest countries in the world. And that's all I have to say, and I will... Um